I want you to see it as an act of partnership that we partner with God to advance his kingdom through our giving. Can I say that again? We partner with God as we advance the kingdom through our giving. Let the church say amen. Let me thank all of you who have already given to our effort in Jackson, Mississippi, where we are about to send some water their way. And I want you to know that God has been good to us uh, through your generosity. And some of you want to give and could not give last week. I wanted to extend it a week so that you would have an opportunity to share today. And so at the end of the service, as we did last week, there will be a bucket for our tithe and offering for those of you that are in the building. But then we'll also have another uh, bucket for those who would like to give to Jackson, Mississippi. Maybe somebody says, I've already given, but God has blessed me. I want to give some more. I want you to know that God has allowed us to raise somewhere near $2,100, $2,200. Could you help me celebrate? Come on, we can do better than that, y'all. Come on, let's celebrate. Amen. And so we look forward to doing even more because guess what? There's a need for it. And I, I don't normally do this on a Sunday morning. I would do this on a Bible study night just to talk about vision and what God has placed in my heart. We have an evangelism ministry that is under the leadership of Brother Jack. Jack, stand up. Jack does an awesome job with our evangelism ministry amen and I'm grateful for brother Jack but the work of evangelism and missions is too much for one person to handle so the Lord has put it on my heart that we're going to continue under the leadership of Jack for our evangelism ministry but we are going to begin a missions ministry and the missions ministry will handle the causes like Jackson Mississippi like Flint Michigan like 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 what where else Houston we Puerto Rico these are efforts that we've already given to but we need a missions department that can handle the weight of missions this is what God wants the church to do he says when you see the least of these you're really ministering unto me and so as of today we will have an evangelism side but we will also have a mission side to help with the area of missions around not just our country but the globe Haiti needs help there are parts of Africa that are going through famine and don't have food and water. And so Carver today begins a new journey for us as not only we will take care of our evangelism side in Los Angeles, Skid Row, those areas that we help out. But I'm asking you to partner with me as we seek to make a difference in the lives of people everywhere. Would you celebrate what God wants to do through us? Amen. And just like uh, other ministries, we're not, we're not capable of, of helping everybody. But we are capable of helping somebody. Somebody say amen right there. And so we're going to do our best to help somebody. And so this week, we will be contacting uh, their two two organizations one church and then we also have an opportunity to contact Jackson State University right there in Jackson Mississippi and we're gonna do our best to be a blessing to those who need water one more time would you give God a rousing praise for what he's gonna do in Jackson Mississippi amen would you bow your heads now as I bless both gift and giver those of you that are online can give now, tithely. Online, you can text to give or on our website. Let's pray. Father, we say thank you.
thank you for the gifts. Thank you, God, for all of the gifts that have been shared as we've tried to do our best to try to help somebody in the area of Jackson, Mississippi, who needs help. But then, God, we thank you for the faithful, generous givers of Carver who week after week continue to obey your word and give according to your word. We know, God, that you said in your word that you bless the generous and cheerful giver. That when we sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. But if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. God, we just thank you for the promise of your word. That you said that if we would take care of the kingdom's needs, your word says you would supply all of our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so God, we say thank you. God, we say thank you. God, we say thank you. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for providing. We pray now that you would bless the gifts that have been shared, that will be shared, that it would be used to upbuild your kingdom. That's our desire. That's our agenda. God, we say thank you in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Amen. Praise God for all of you. Again, we will give in the building at the end of our worship experience. Would you help me celebrate our music ministry? We thank God for them. Amen. We thank God for them. Today, we are grateful today that as the Lord has put on my heart to allow Minister Harvey to stand today and to declare God's holy word. Minister Harvey is a great preacher. He is one who I know is serious about the word of God. He is serious about declaring the word of God. He's serious in his preparation to declare the word of God. And he has been called to preach the gospel. And I'm grateful. Yeah, yeah, it's all right to clap right there. I'm grateful to have such reliable help that when I need him to preach, he's ready to roll. Let me say to you, Carver, that God has blessed, God has blessed us with Minister Harvey to help us, to help us. We have talented gifted, serious people here trying to do the work of the ministry. And I'm grateful for Minister Harvey today. Would you just point in his direction and just say, Minister Harvey, is there a word from the Lord? Let's prepare our hearts for the word of God with this old hymn, this old hymn. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, Pilgrim through this barren land, God, come on church, me, oh thou great, great Jehovah. Come on, let's do it like the old church. Stand to your feet. Oh, peel grab through this oh, barren, barren land. I am weak. But thou art mighty, hold me with thy powerful hand. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Oh, hold me with thy 
Pow, pow, powerful, powerful hand, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more bread. Bread of heaven. Come on, church, lift your hand and say that. Bread, bread of heaven. Until I oh, 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 no, no more. Come on, get that hand lifted. I believe we ought to say that again. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I, I want no more. Somebody lift it up. Bread. Oh, bread of heaven. Come on, somebody say, bread of puts me in the mind of Dr. E.E. E. Stafford from Mount Tabor Baptist Church. Old school. That's where I came from. Good morning, Carver. Is there anybody who come to praise the Lord this morning? Well, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I hope that you're ready to say so this morning as I need you to help me preach this sermon. First, give an honor to God, the head of my life. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for the Lord on my side. Thank you, Pastor Manuel, for yet another opportunity to stand behind this desk, preach the gospel. And for you, Carver, family and friends, thank you for rolling with a brother. We still rolling. Thank you. Standing with me. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, most awesome and Gracious God, Lord, your people come to you this morning, first of all, giving you thanks. Thank you for all you've done for us. You carried us through last week. You brought us through this week. And Father, we're here today because we know you've already deposited a word. Father, we're here to cash on in to hear what thus says the Lord. Father, as I stand behind this desk, I ask that you cover me with your blood. Strengthen me now, Father, 
remove any doubt, any nervousness. I ask you to speak now. Speak to your people, Father. There's a word from heaven. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray that all that's in agreement say amen. Thank you. You may be seated. But not just yet. I ask the Lord to remove the nervousness. So, if you would, would you please meet me in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 7. There's a word from God today. If you have it, say, I've got it. If not, say, hold up. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, and it reads as this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I like to title this message, All I Want to Do is Be a Good Steward of God's Grace. All I Want to Do is Be a Good Steward of God's Grace. Help me, Holy Spirit. I have a question for you this morning. It doesn't require an answer. But I do want you to ponder the possibilities. I do want you to ponder what you would say. How's that working out for you? How is this Christian lifestyle working out for you? Hmm? Sometimes we're too busy asking people what's going on with you how you doing but this morning i want to ask the question to the church how are you doing how are you really doing with this christian life hmm? if you don't remember anything else i say this morning remember we as believers must always be careful about how we behave and how we conduct ourselves in a world that may have you think we need to do it a different way. Amen? But a true believer in Jesus possesses all I want to do is be a good steward of God's grace kind of attitude. Amen? So if you allow me just a few minutes of your time this morning... I promise I won't keep you long. Can we talk about being a good steward of God's grace? If you could glance through the rearview mirror of my life, you would see that I'm a good candidate for being a good, uh, being a good grace, being a good steward. You might say, why? Because I spent so much time I've got so much practice at asking for mercy. Amen? So this morning, the Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Peter, under divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he pins his first letter to the Christian believers in Rome who are suffering from escalating persecutions by the Romans. The purpose of his letter was to teach them how to live victoriously in the midst of their hostility without losing hope, without becoming bitter, all while trusting in the Lord and looking forward to his second coming. The people were homeless. The people were hopeless. And many had been killed, resulting in persecutions that spread throughout the Roman Empire. 
the people who were considered aliens, they needed spiritual strengthening because their sufferings, because of their sufferings and what they were going through, kind of sounds like us today. Peter wants us to know today that those who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, those who, according to God's great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Those who are protected by the power of God, those who are being built up as a spiritual house for holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, must be mindful about living in the world and not being of the world. Hmm? So to put it another way, we need to get our minds right. Hmm? The Bible says, prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But in the words of the hymnologist, our hope is built on nothing less. But Jesus' blood and his righteousness, we dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. But can we talk about it this morning? Hmm. This is the day that the Lord has made, right? We should be glad and rejoicing in it, right? So can we talk about this Jesus? Those two words have been in my system all week long since last week. This Jesus. Can we talk about this Jesus this morning? This Jesus. The stone that was rejected by man. This Jesus, their salvation and no one else. This Jesus heals the sick and raises the dead. This Jesus, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth and in under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus, this Jesus, is Lord. To the glory of the Father. The Bible says, I need your help. The Bible says they stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. And they placed a royal crown of thorns on his head until blood came streaming down. They spit on him. They made him carry his own cross to the place called the place of the skull. They nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. They teased him. They mocked him. They said, he saved others. Why don't he save himself? Hmm? The Bible says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And with his wounds, we are healed. This Jesus, he died. But that's not the end of the story. Early, early Sunday morning, he got up with all power, all power in his hands. This Jesus, I'm talking about this Jesus, is sitting on the right hand side of God right now, interceding for you and I. This Jesus. He died for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order that he may bring us to God. Hmm? He was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit. So therefore, I'm on 
verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Why? Because whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, no longer living for the lust of men, but living for the will of God. So, if your attitude is, all I want to do is be a good steward of God's grace. If that's your attitude, I'm here to tell you today, your time is up. Your time is up on living like the world. It's time to live holy lives considering Jesus' return. It's time to walk away from sin and follow in the way of the Lord. It's time. It's time to start being a good steward of God's grace. Can we talk about it this morning? But according to my study, a steward is a person who manages another's property or financial affairs, or a person who has charge of the household of another regarding buying items or obtaining food or directing people or whatsoever. A person appointed by an organization or group to supervise the affairs of that group at certain functions. And grace. Grace. This morning it came to me as an acronym, God realizing all. I forgot what it was. But don't worry about that. Grace! Grace is God's undeserved, undue, unearned, divine favor towards believers. That's you and me. It's God freely giving good things to believers that they know they don't deserve. You know you didn't qualify for the job you currently hold. That's grace. You know you can't really afford that vehicle that you just financed. That's grace. You know you have more withdrawals in your savings account than you have deposits. But your balance has never went to zero. That's grace. You know you deserve death. But God gave you new life. You were born again. That's grace. All I'm trying to say is the greatest grace given is this Jesus. Amen. This Jesus. But yet, while we were sinners, Christ died. He died on a cross to save us. Hmm? But keep in mind, God's promises, God's word, and God's work of redemption all originate from God's grace. All we have is due to God's grace. Therefore, if all you want to do is be a good steward of God's grace, be a good manager of the grace that was already freely given to you. Be a good steward of the grace that God just freely gave to you. He said, here you go. Even though you don't deserve it, here you go. Grace. Grace. We are to live in this world, but be not of this world. We're not to be conformed to the wrong way of doing things. We're to set, we're set apart for the purposes of God. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. But why stay ready? Why stay ready? Because the end of all things is at hand. I'm at the beginning of verse 7 as we begin this sermon. The end of all things is at hand. It's possible. It's possible. Peter could be talking about the end of the world is coming. Or it's possible. He could be talking about the end of the temple worship and the day when the temple would be destroyed. Or... It's possible. He could be talking about the nearness of death for those reading and those hearing this word. Nah. And all that's possible. But after careful study, 
I believe there's another possibility. In the Greek, the phrase, the end of all things, could be translated as the aim of all things, the purpose of all things, or the goal of all things is at hand or nearby. What Peter's saying here is, beware, this Jesus, the one who I was talking about in verse 1, is coming back. He's coming back. You can search the internet and find ample predictions on when the world is going to end. But if you don't know, now you know. They all wrong. They all wrong. The world is not going to end by nuclear holocaust. The world is not going to end by Russia starting World War III with Ukraine. It's not going to end that way. And it certainly didn't end as predicted in 1999. Hmm. I don't know. If the world would have ended in 1999, I can only speak for myself. I know I probably wouldn't have been in heaven. 1999. It was predicted that the world would end, but it didn't. The world would end when Jesus comes back. Amen? The world we in when Jesus comes back. He came. He lived. He died. God raised him from the dead. And he said he's coming back. He's coming back. Are you ready for your tomorrow? Today? Are you ready for your tomorrow? Today. If you knew that tomorrow... You had to stand before God and give an account of what you did yesterday. How different would your walk be? How different would your talk be? How might your priorities change? The Bible calls believers to live with this kind of anticipation. To walk right. To talk right. To do the things of God with the anticipation of the return of the King. This is what he's talking about. If you knew that tomorrow you had to stand before God and give an account of what you did yesterday, how might you behave at home? How would you perform on the job? How would you treat your neighbor? Would your worship be any stronger? Would your love be any different? I'm not a betting man because I hate to lose. But I bet if you knew that you had to stand before God tomorrow, everything would be different today. Huh? In the words of our pastor, believers ought to reference him, rely on him, represent him, and rest in him. Hmm? But what's the motivation? What's the motivation to be holy? What's the incentive to do the right thing? The incentive is at the beginning of verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. That's the incentive. So for all those who tend to procrastinate, more than others. The Bible says it will happen. It's next on the big thing on the calendar. It's unpredictable. But you might not get the same chance to be with Jesus as that thief on the cross did. Don't miss your opportunities to be with Jesus. Don't miss it. You can't wait until you see the lightning flash or hear the thunder roll before you start thinking about your soul. You can't do that. Why? Because the end of all things is right now. It's at hand right now. Either you get right or you left. But however, there is a foolproof way to respond to the non-believer's inquiry 
about the end of the world. There's a foolproof way. And so you can respond this way and you're not mistaken for a false prophet. But it's kind of elementary, though. I don't know if you're looking for anything big or sermonic, but it's kind of elementary. The believer's response should go a little something like this. I don't know. But the end of all things is at hand. When will the world end? When is Jesus coming back? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. But the end of all things is at hand. But the truth of the matter is, we've already spent enough time in the past living our best lives. Already done that. Been there, done that. Enough time doing what everyone else is doing in the world. Living in sensuality. Having immoral passions. Indulging in drunkenness. Participating in orgies. Hosting drinking parties. And living in lawless idolatry. We've already spent enough time wasting it. Spinning our wheels. We've already wasted enough time. We should have been done sinning a long time ago. It's now time to commit to the Lord. It's now time to commit to the Lord. So in other words, it's time to stop playing church. It's time to commit. Because the end is near. I'm going to keep saying it. That's, that's this passage. The end is at hand. The ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus has already kicked off the last days. The last days begun when Jesus got up. Huh? And knowing that, knowing that this Jesus is expected to show up at any moment should be more than enough incentive to live in a godly way. Hmm? The end of all things is at hand, people. It represents that point in time that which all things must come to an end. Because Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. All things mean the whole thing. Everything. Every kind of thing. Everyone in every place where you've been doing the thing must end. Must end. Because the return of the Messiah is at hand. Is at hand means it's close. It's nearby. It's approaching. To be moving towards and not be far distant from. A present tense action. A right now action, that's what it's talking about. Not at hand. Not at hand. Was at hand. Not was at hand, but is at hand. The Bible says, seek the things and set your mind on things that are above. Not on the things that are, that are on the earth. In other words, keep your mind stayed on Jesus. Huh? Keep your mind stayed on Jesus. It's not by our will. It's by the Father's will. Not our will, but God's will be done on earth as in heaven. So what is God's will? Some my ass. I'm glad you asked. God's will is that believers should be alert and sober-minded for the sake of their prayers. Living in sacrificial love that includes hospitality to one another without mumbling and without grumbling. And using their God-given gifts, whether speaking or serving, to help others. With the intention and motivation and all they do to see God glorified through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. So if all you want to do is be a good steward of God's grace. The first thing you need to know is believers ought to live a life of expectancy. Believers ought to live a life of expectancy. Believers ought to live a life of eagerness, watchfulness, and anticipation of the return of the king. 
We are to expect Jesus to return at any given moment. Any given moment. The last days are upon us right now. Right now. Peter said, though, Peter said in the last days, we'll hear unbelievers say, where is this promise that, that this Jesus is coming back? Because as far as we know, things have been the same since the beginning of time. It's been the same. Where is this Jesus that everybody's talking about? But don't miss this one fact, though. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as is a day. So it's only been approximately two days since Jesus got up. You got to look at it that way, change perspective. It's only been two days since Jesus got up according to the Bible. Two days. So the incentive for the believer not to be of the world is the return of the Messiah. And since the end is at hand, since we're being born again, since we're called to be holy, since we're being built up as a spiritual house, since we're God's people, since we're keeping our honorable conduct, since we're eager to do what is good, and since Jesus suffered in the flesh for our sins, and since love covers a multitude of sins, and since things are passing away, why are we spending so much energy being like the world? Since we're only here to exist for a short time anyway. The Bible says, just as the grass withers and the flower fades, we will not last forever. We won't last forever. But there's a story told by Dr. Jeff Myers of Crossroad Ministry of a little boy whose, whose mom allegedly made the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. At least he thought so. One day he strolled into the house and the aroma arrested his, his attention. And he knew what time it was. He was hungry and he was excited. First he strolled into the house, but now he walked with a purpose until he got to the cookies. As his mom finished baking the cookies, she placed him on the cookie jar on top of the counter, far out of his reach. And then she said, keep your hands out of the cookie jar until after dinner. Some of us has heard that before. But you know the mindset of a young boy. The very thing we're told not to do is exactly the thing that we want to do. So as soon as his mom left the room, he quietly placed the step stool up to the counter. He carefully pulled himself up as gently as he could, as not to make any suspicious sound. And he stuck his hand in the cookie jar. Just when his mom unexpectedly walked back into the room because she forgot to secure the top on the cookie jar. Catching him red-handed, she said, Charles, is that what you want to be doing when Jesus returns for you? Hmm. And this is the same with us today. Some of us have our hands in the cookie jar of this world, doing everything we feel is right in our own eyes, being filled with everything except for the Spirit. Just as Charles was expected to wait until after dinner to get his cookies, Believers are to live a life of expectancy because this Jesus is coming back. I keep saying this Jesus is coming back. But now that we realize the imminent return of our Lord, we'll, that it will happen, that it is next, and that it is unpredictable, how should we respond as believers? How should we respond as believers? I believe once you know better, you do better. Huh? Peter now says, therefore. I'm still in verse 7, if you have your Bibles open. Therefore, he says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. 
bake of your prayers. When Jesus went up to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he asked Peter, James, and John to wait right here and watch. But when he returned to find them sleeping, he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is weak. The spirit is indeed willing. But the flesh, the flesh is weak. Believers ought to be watchful for Jesus' return. This kind of watchfulness is of extreme importance. In the phrase, watch, watch with me, the Greek word used here is gregario, meaning to be awake or watchful, stressing the importance of being ready for the Son of Man's revival. Hmm. Watchful. Are you ready for your tomorrow? Today? Simmons, are you ready for your tomorrow? Today. Meaning an instantaneous transformation is about to take place. We should always be, be preparing our minds for action by being of sound mind and judgment for the purposes of prayer. For the purposes of prayer. We know not when he comes. But this Jesus said, surely I'm coming soon. Mm. Come here, Ezekiel, and testify to your people of the importance of being a watchful servant. This is what Ezekiel said. He said, when seven days were finished, the Lord gave this message to me. Son of man, I made you a guard to warn Israel's people about danger. You must listen to the message that I will give to you. Then you must use my messages to warn the Israelites. I may say to the wicked person, your punishment will be death. Then you must warn that person, you must tell him to stop doing wicked things so that he may save his life. If you don't, if you do not tell the wicked person this, he will die because of his sins. But I will say that you are guilty as if you had killed him yourself. So you must warn the wicked person. If you warn him, he still may not stop doing wicked things. Then that wicked person will die because of his sins. But you will have saved your life. A righteous person, the Bible says, may stop doing things that are right. He may start doing, he may start to do bad things. Then I will put him in danger. He will die and ask punishment for his sins. I will not remember the good things that he did. But if you have not warned him of the danger, I will say that you are guilty. It is as you killed him yourself. But if you don't warn, but if you do warn the righteous person to stop doing bad things, he may agree. Then, we, then he will continue to live because you warned him. You warned him. You also will have to save your life. It says you also will have saved your life because you warned him. You was on the watch out. You were being watchful. So therefore, a believer can save their own life for being ever watchful always expecting and being a sound mind for the return of the king. If you're not in the right state of mind and you're not displaying sound judgment, your prayers have no power. But knowing and expecting the second coming of our Savior should motivate you into a lifestyle of holiness. It should. The former head of United Negro College Funds, Arthur Fletcher said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Do you agree with me? A mind that's filled with worldly emotions and passions and out of control behavior that's chasing after worldly lust 
and indulging in wickedness cannot comprehend the power of prayer. But the good news is, God is your strength and your portion forever. I'm going to say that one more time. God is your strength and your portion forever. The psalmist said, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. And my steps had nearly slipped. You know why God didn't let you fall? Because he loves you. Jesus loves you. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. He wants you to love your neighbors too. But above all, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins anyway, but not only are we to live with the expectancy of Jesus' return, be alert for the purposes of prayer. But thirdly, believers are to have a passionate kind of love for one another. Above all, he says, outside of seeking first the kingdom of God, though, keep loving one another with an unfailing kind of love. Not just some ordinary love, but passionate love. They may call you the overweight lover. But do you have passionate love? That's what I'm asking. But Paul tells us, the only way to show passionate love is to keep in step with the Spirit. By displaying fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. That means loving someone else more than you love yourself. Huh? Counting it all joy for someone else when you have no joy of your own. Having patience with someone else when your patience has run out. Showing kindness and goodness when all they show to you is evil. Being faithful to your spouse who's been faithless to you. And showing gentleness and self-control. So, if you're passionate about the kind of love that you have, if you want that passionate kind of love, keep in step with the Spirit. Hmm? Jesus said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, keep on loving one another. Continue loving one another. Maintain love for one another. Since love covers a multitude of sins, it says it right there in the Bible. But to understand the metaphor of covering is to appreciate the power of salvation. For instance, on the Day of Atonement, the blood of the sacrifice, it was, poured over, it was poured over the throne of God to cover the sins of his people. If you have unrepented sin in your life, let God cover you with the blood of Jesus. He covered you when he was beaten all night. He covered you as he walked up Calvary's hill. He covered you as they nailed his hands and his feet. He covered you when they hung him up on that old rugged cross. He covered you when he took his last breath. He covered you when, he rolled, when they rolled the stone in front of the grave. He covered you when he got up early on Sunday morning with all power in his hands. He's covering you right now as he sits on the right-hand side of the Father. Huh? Can I take you back? Can I take you back to the Garden of Eden? With Adam and Eve, when they sinned, the Bible says they felt the shame. Huh? They became aware of their nakedness. And in their shame, they tried to hide because they desired covering from God. They desired covering. But God, but God, God came into the garden and he saw that they were hiding in their shame, weighed down by the burden of their guilt. Therefore, he made them coverings from animal skins, and he covered their shame. 
And this was the first act of redeeming grace. And, and throughout the scriptures, the ideal of redemption is understood in the terms of God covering his guilty, naked people. Hmm? Is there anybody besides me that's guilty? I'm guilty, but God covered me. Hmm? God wants to clothe you with righteousness of Jesus. He takes the righteousness of his son and he uses it as camouflage to cover the sins of his people. Camouflage. Camouflage. You can put camouflage on and the enemy won't see you because you cover with the blood of Jesus. All the sins that you've done, you camouflage with the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter. You ask for forgiveness, you're covered with the blood of Jesus. The only way we can remain standing is to be camouflaged in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Since love covers a multitude of sins, let us cover one another with our love. But James, the brother of Jesus, says this. If anyone among you should wander away from the truth and someone turns him back, he should know that the one who turns away a sinner back from the error of his ways will save that person's soul from death and will cover a great number of sins. In this way, love covers sin. But however, if you love in this way, according to the Bible, it says, show hospitality to another without grumbling. Without grumbling. Showing hospitality to the ones you know is easy. They need it too. But what Peter is saying here is believers need to show a little love and kindness to the man or the woman on the streets that they don't know. Those who are worse off than us. Those who truly are in need. Those who we need to be hospitable to. We need to display a little bit more hospitality. Hospitality. That means share your home with someone who's homeless. Or offer a meal to someone who's hungry. Clothe someone who looks like they've been going through the storm. What have you done to show your hospitality lately? Huh? What have you done lately to somebody you don't know? The writer of Hebrews says, Do not neglect hospitality because through this some have entertained angels as guests without knowing it. But remember the prisoners as though you were a fellow prisoner. Remember the mistreated as if you had been mistreated in the body. So let us show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. It may be hard, but it says without grumbling. But speaking of grumbling, there's a plumber that I know Russ is his name. And Russ was the kind of guy who would never let you see him sweat, unlike me. But no matter how big or how small the task was, his favorite tagline was, easy peasy. Hmm? And every job that was thrown at him, he had the same response, easy peasy. The one thing that made it so easy for Russ was that he was gifted to serve. And every time he was called to serve, it was easy peasy. And so it is for us today. The Bible says, as each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. That's in verse 10. I'm almost done. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in his varied forms. There's all kind of forms of grace. God say, administer them in all different kind of forms. Grace. The phrase whatever gifts means, we've been given a gift different in kind and amount. And each one should, whatever, should use whatever gift received 
from the Lord to serve others. We may have different gifts, but they all come from the same God. Therefore, lastly, as I get ready to take my seat, Believers ought to use their gifts to serve one another. Don't be stingy with your gifts because you're not the owner of the gift. You're not the source of the gift. You're not the creator of the gift. You're just the recipient of the gift. And the job of the recipient is just to be a good steward of God's grace. Hmm? Therefore, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. What Peter said is whoever, anyone, anybody, it don't matter who, all that would speak, all that would serve, let them speak the words of God, let them serve by the strength that God supplies, all for the sake of God. It's all for the sake of God. So whatever your hands finds to do, do it with all your might. Because God will strengthen you. It's not by your strength. It's by the strength that's supplied by God. God will supply whatever you need to keep you going when you feel weak. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. Which brings me back to my question. How's that working out for you? Huh? How's this Christian lifestyle working out for you? You had time to ponder. But understand, church, from Genesis to Revelations, it's all about this Jesus. If all you want to do is be a good steward of God's grace, it starts with this Jesus. The Bible says he came, he lived, he died, he got up, and he's coming back. Are you ready? For your tomorrow, today? Are you ready for your tomorrow today? If you don't know, now you know. The end of all things is at hand. So, so now we have the incentive to live right. The end of all things is at hand. Verse 7. You heard the instructions on how to live right. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. That's 7B through the first part of 11. And you now know why. Why we should live right. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So there's one more thing for you to know, though, before I take my seat. It's at the end of the verse 11. Got your Bibles open. It says, To God belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Doors of the church are open. Doors of the church are open. God bless you. The doors of the church are open. Is there anybody here or in our listening audience that need a church home. Why don't you come make Carver your home? If you need a place to worship and grow in faith, we have a dynamite preacher that is ready 
to feed you the word of God. You may say, Pastor or Minister Harvey, I need to rededicate myself to the Lord. Why don't you come now? If you're not in the building, you don't you, you can just type it in a section, comment section. I want to join or I want to rededicate myself with the Lord Jesus Christ at the Carver Church. The doors of the church are open. You may even have been out of fellowship and you just want to come home. Why don't you come? We're now back in service. The doors of the church are open. Although the doors of the church never closed. They're open for you. Come as you are. The Bible says come as you are. That means you don't have to get yourself ready. You don't have to get some new clothes and, and do all of this and that. You can just type it in a section. I want to join Carver Church. I want to rededicate myself. I want to renew my vows. My covenant. That's all you need to do. Amen. Help me give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The tithes and offering has already been prayed for. your way out, you can leave your tithes, your offerings, and your donations at the door. Would you please stand with me as we get ready to leave? I don't know who I was talking to today, but as we live in this world, there's a lot of things that we can get involved in. But the Bible says we need to be ready with anticipation of the return of the King. It's not about the end of the world coming. That's not it. It's about the return of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed. Peace and blessings be upon you. Amen. Those of you that are giving your tithe and offering can see Deacon Eric Perkins. If you're giving to our water effort in Mississippi, you can see Deacon Kevin Holmes. God bless you. God bless you. Make sure you encourage our preacher today. Wonderful job by Minister Harvey. Come on, church. Let's encourage him. God bless you.